Hi, I'm Dr. Jeffrey LeBenger. At Summit Medical Group, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important healthcare issues that affect their lives. That's why we're very proud to support important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Summit Medical Group, a physician-owned multi-specialty medical practice serving northern and central New Jersey in 70 locations. St. Peter's University, the Jesuit University of New Jersey. Suez, ready for the resource revolution. MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community and by the Give Something Back Foundation, providing mentors and scholarships to help Pell Grant eligible students go to college and graduate in four years debt free. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got that? this? Here it is, man. Look at it. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio here in the heart of Lincoln Center. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome Peter Wilderotter, who is the president and chief executive officer of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Welcome. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, by the way, you know public broadcasting well, don't you? Yeah, I worked for WNYC for six years in the early part of the, this century. Helping to raise money. Helping to raise money. We still do that. We still <laughs> <laughs> We never stop doing You've that. You've got probably a couple of tote bags in your closet. And yeah, fighting the good cause. Yeah. Um, speaking of good causes, this foundation, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, extraordinary. Talk about Christopher and Dana Reeve first who they were, why they matter so much in the work of this foundation, why it's so important. Yeah, I think we tell the story of spinal cord work um, the way we tell the story of history, B.C. and A.D., before Christopher and after Dana. And before Chris, um, there really wasn't that much hope. Um, you were, um, if your family, um, if you yourself had a spinal cord injury, you were met uh, by a doctor in a hospital and essentially said, here's your chair. Um, here's your medications, uh, here's, uh, here's what you can get used to and, uh, and what the, the state will provide. And oh, by the way, in sort of a cruel afterthought, um, uh, that which you get back in the first couple of weeks after the injury is what you can expect for the rest of your life. Chris changed that dogma completely. He actually had the audacity to talk about a cure and, uh, and fought um, uh, the good fight uh, to raise awareness, to raise money, to get scientists to collaborate, to get the community to participate in that. Excuse and me, take a step back. Chris's accident was? In 1995. And I, put in context, I'm sorry for interrupting, Peter, but put in context for those who may not remember what and who Christopher was at the time in the American um, pop culture scene and why he was such an important figure. Well, Chris was, a, was an extraordinarily well-known actor. Um, and he was Superman. And he literally played Superman. He literally played Superman. And, uh, and so it became the metaphor. You know, super, Superman got injured. Uh, and he used that celebrity. He actually used that celebrity prior to his injury. He founded an organization called the Creative Coalition um, because he believed that actors uh, not only should be lend their name to organizations, but they should be informed and educated. Um, I actually met him in a previous organization, um, uh, because he was an advocate, the organization was Planned Parenthood. He was a big believer in a woman's right to choose and international family planning. And so he gave his celebrity and he changed the game. Uh, he changed the way people think about spinal cord injury, certainly the support that the foundation that bears his name uh, garnered. Uh, and um, while he was out talking about a cure, um, his wife uh, really talked about a care and the fact that at the time of the injury, there was no place for people to turn to get the information that they needed, 
um, how to make their homes accessible, how to navigate this new life and what was coming down the road. And so she created our Paralysis Resource Center, which has helped over 70,000 people um, in those early stages, as well as any questions that they might have about the in injury information that they might right. need, a peer-to-peer -peer network. They were extraordinary so, people. So, so Chris, Christopher winds up dying what year? He died in 2004. And just a couple of years later, Literally 18 months later. 18 months later, Dana dies of lung cancer. She dies of lung cancer. <sighs> Two people, um, vital, young, strong. This happens to them. They have young children. Mm -hmm. Who were the young children and what ages? Uh, at the time of, I think, uh, Matthew, I think, was 22 or 23. Alexandra was 21. Uh, and Will was 14 at the time of... of their, uh, of their passing. Um, and in fact, uh, Dana died in March of 2006. Uh, we had a board meeting the next day and we nominated uh, Matthew and Alexandra to our board. And they've been extraordinary board members and carry the vision of their folks uh, on and uh, to this day. And Will, um, uh, when he graduated from college and started his career in broadcasting, um, joined our board and has been an extraordinary advocate to help us spread the word. Put a spinal cord injury into its proper context for us, Peter, if you could. How many people in this country are dealing with spinal cord injuries? Uh, 1,275,000. Um, that was done through a study that we did. There are 5.5 million that, are, um, that have some form of paralysis due to a, something that occurred in the central nervous system. Our resource center helps all living with paralysis. Our research is really focused on trying to find cures for spinal cord injury. Um, and we have, we've spent over $120 million um, in advancing um, therapies that we believe will get to the clinic very, very soon. You know, a few months back, an extraordinary young man, um, former standout for the Rutgers University football team you know well. Eric Legrand. So Eric Legrand, uh, a hero. For me and for so many others, uh, we actually wound up doing a full half hour with Eric. By the way, go on our website. Our team is about to put it up on the screen right now, um, steveautobato.org. All of our programs, our team is so great. That's what they do. They let folks know where you can find our programs. But check out Eric Legrand. Eric was injured in the year 2010 <clears throat> at a, a Rutgers football game against uh, Army. Eric tells his own story. Um, he did the interview in his wheelchair, and he has to be one of the most positive, extraordinary role models. But he's made progress, and he continues to make progress, and he's connected to your organization, and he's very optimistic. Why? He's optimistic because we know so much more now. In the, in the early days, we believed uh, there was no science. There was no research. Um, and uh, so because of the, the, of the pioneers and, and the organization, the American Paralysis Association that existed before Chris was injured, they funded a lot of the basic science that took us to where we are now. And Eric is optimistic because he's part of our Neuro Recovery Network, which is the Treadmill. Neuro Recovery Network. Right, and we have a site right at the Kessler Foundation um, in West Orange where Chris was treated, and Eric goes there, and uh, it's treadmill training where they suspend Eric, and they really rework um, his, his, uh, his legs uh, because the spinal cord has a memory and it re-engages and reignites uh, that which is going on. So he's very, very optimistic. And, yeah. and by the way, go back to the Kessler Foundation because they're uh, not only a supporter of some of the public programming, uh, public television programming we do, but we also I moderate a whole range of conferences on uh, work that Kessler is doing. But I have some of the work they're doing is groundbreaking and I'm struck by the progress, the science there, the research there, which has me seeing things I never thought were possible, people are able to walk that we never thought we were able to. That's, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that is due to technology. You know, and they were a funder of one of the early uh, patients that we had in what is becoming our big idea, where one implants a um, off-the-shelf Medtronic device used for pain. Medtronic. Medtronic, uh, the company. And this device um, uh, goes above the dura of the spine where the injury was and excites 
um, those neurons that uh, have been silent for a long time and reignites and creates those pathways. Um, and we're seeing people get bowel, f bladder uh, uh, function back, um, temperature control, extraordinary things that heretofore would never be anticipated. So Eric is very optimistic and has every right to be optimistic. Um, his, he has a smile that, that would fill this room mm -hmm. and that optimism. And he reminds us very much of Chris as his mom, who's a member of our team now, Eric's mom. Um, remember, uh, reminds us of Dana. Let me ask you this, in a couple of minutes we have left. Some of the misconceptions that many of us have about those who are dealing with spinal cord injuries, who are dealing with paralysis. A, that we think that there's very limited progress. And again, every case is different. Every you know, individual has a different case. But that we're so pessimistic, some of us. I mean, metaphorically, I mean, a lot of folks out there. That's one. But what else do we need to know about spinal cord injury and its future? I think we need to know that uh, disabled doesn't mean unabled. And so that we have a quality of life program. We, we've given over 20 million in grants to local organizations, um, teams that uh, want to, uh, so that individuals with disabilities can participate in sports and things along those lines. Wheelchair ballroom dancing, making the Bear, Bear Mountain accessible so that those in chairs can get to the summit. Um, making gardens um, accessible uh, so that people can fully, fully participate. I think the real misconception is that um, we don't know, when we see somebody in a wheelchair, we don't know how to interact and connect with how that we? person. We should just go up and, and talk to them and ask them how they're doing and ask them about their injury and they will be willing to, and ask them what their dreams and aspirations uh, are because they have them and they will succeed um, maybe their dreams were somewhat changed when that injury occurred. As Eric said, Susan but, but, but Eric, but Eric is, is a, has a career in broadcasting. Chris mm. acted from the chair. He taught his son how to ride a bike from the chair. And so that is the message that we need to it, It's so interesting you say that. Um, Eric Luran told us, yeah, he did want to play in the NFL, but since that was not possible, he wanted to be the best broadcaster he could be. And he exactly. focused on what... Check this out. Trust me. It's a powerful interview. He said he wanted to focus on what he could do, not on what he was not able to do and be right. the best at what he could do. Real quick, if I could get you to talk about this, the emotional and psychological piece for those who are dealing with spinal cord injuries. How, how do you help folks deal with that side of the equation? We have people like Karen Legrand. We have people like Dana Reeve. Um, that, and we've created a peer-to-peer -peer network that... that aligns someone uh, who has had a similar injury. Uh, that's how we got to Eric. Uh, that's what Chris would do. He would read about somebody, he would hear about somebody, he would pick the phone up and call them. And that's a life-changing call to get a, uh, to get a call from Christopher Reeve. And the foundation continues to do that. How do you raise your money? Day in and day out. We raise our money through events, we raise our money through Team Legrand, we raise our money through direct response. People can go to our website and give a gift online, ChristopherReeve.org. Um, and we're, you know, and we need it, and we'll put it to great use. As a student of leadership, uh, as folks know, I often ask the number one leadership lesson great leaders like yourself have learned. What's the number one leadership lesson you've learned so far? The most, I think the leadership lesson that I've learned came from my background. Um, there were three things that my parents told me. I, I either had to be a priest, a lawyer, and go to St. Benedict's. So I went to St. Benedict's. Uh, because I wasn't smart enough or holy enough to do the first two. St. Benedict's Prep in Newark. Where my son teaches religion Is that right? and theology right I'm now, on the board, yeah. and, I was on, and your dad was on the board with us. That's right. And um, the, the leadership lesson of, of St. Benedict's is, is its motto. Um, whatever hurts my brother hurts me. And um, we're in this all together, and that's what we have to deliver. Well, that's what the Benedictines uh, taught, and, and yeah. Father Edwin Lays, one Father of our Ed, leaders his, and heroes. That's a hero. Yeah. Um, Peter, thank you for joining us, the president and CEO of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, an extraordinary organization. Thank and, you. and check out Eric Legrand. Good stuff. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. To watch more One on One with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Meanwhile, though Othello never knew, he was getting schemed on by a member of his crew. Iago, charming and his rhyming was great, but behind all the greats, he was the slimiest snake. You wonder why, man? You wonder why, man? 
tell you why I'm mad. Check it. Three of the hottest hip hop producers in town told them my album should drop next and that I should throw down. Now I know what I should be. I know what I'm worth. But Othello just ignores me and says, Cassio's first. Yo, battle after battle after battle with this crew. I murdered mad MCs, but what's Othello do? He deals the freshman a fresh hand and he makes him his best man and lessens my chances by making me yes man. So hip hop and Shakespeare, there you go. And we've got uh, GQ and JQ. They are the Q brothers, the creators of Othello, the remix off Broadway at the West Side Theater, 407 West 43rd Street. Gentlemen, how you doing? Great, Good. Steve. How Good you to doing? Be Coming to us from the north side of Chicago, <laughs> here to New York City. Yes, sir. This is your idea. Way back, you were 19 years of age. At what school? I was at the Experimental Theater Wing at the School of the Arts, and uh, it wasn't just my idea. It was me and a group of friends, and it was kind of like some kind of intervention from a greater source that was like, this needs to be done. Because what we set out to do is just merge hip hop and theater. And we ran out of time to make something original. And it turns out, as you know, Shakespeare is public domain. So yeah. why not? And then as soon as we started <laughs> translating, it made perfect sense. So well, then your little brother, your actual little brother. Yes. You, Jay. Jay, you told him, you say, hey, I've got something here. Yeah. What's yes, he say? I was, in, I was like my first year of college and he said, uh, Hey, can you, you're always drawing in your notebook. Can you like help us make a flyer with some of your graffiti? And I was like, what's the flyer for? And he said, I got this idea. Me and my boys are doing this thing. It's a hip hop version of Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors. And I was like, okay. And I was like, do you need, like, can I DJ it? And he's like, well, maybe when you get here, you know? And so then the next year I transferred to New York and, and we started going, so. Yeah. Set this up for us. And so the people want to go see it, describe it. So that at the time was the Bomity of Errors, which ran off Broadway 17 years ago. And we were like kids, our dream came true. We went off to do uh, a bunch of movies, TV. All, we were been in LA for eight years, Chicago for another six. We've been all over. We all started doing different things. 17 years later and three plays later, we are rewriting, recreating, adapting, as we call it, instead of adapting, adapting. Um, Shakespeare's Othello. It's called Othello the Remix. It was originally commissioned by the Globe Theater in London and Chicago Shakespeare Theater mm. on Navy Pier in Chicago. And um, we've traveled the world with like three different versions of it. 12 countries in four years. Um, we've won awards all over the world as uh, Best Ensemble, Best New Work in festivals, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, uh, Melbourne Arts Festival, um, you name it. We've been to South Korea, the United Arab Emirates. <clears throat> but we've created the fourth folio version, which is uh, the newest version of the play. <laughs> we've upped every little stake we can. We've added some musical numbers. Yeah, there's new songs. I mean, this is definitely the tightest version of the show we've ever done. Yeah, and yes. it's, for, it's for New York. How did two of you collaborate on this? Um, so we both, we both wrote it, we both directed it, we're both in it. Um, Who else is in it? The <clears throat> Where'd you get these the other music. folks? What's yeah, that? so the, the, I think that one of the cool things about this show as opposed to other shows that you might see um, in New York right now is that th there were no auditions for the show. The show was written for this ensemble. Yeah. We wrote it, we're in it, and our two best friends are the other two people Pasta, in Pringle it. Pringle and Jackson Dorn. <laughs> and they, you know, basically, um, they've been a part of our company for uh, anywhere from nine to 20 years, depending on which one you're talking about. And the creation- you got, me, we got a DJ. Yeah, DJ Supernova. DJ Supernova. Yeah, he's you from knew, New York. He, he's from New York, yeah. he was in it, and you were like, let's, he actually was in our version of uh, A Christmas Carol. We do something called the Q Brothers Christmas Carol. And since it was coming to New York, we cast him as our DJ in the New York version because he's from here. And, and uh, he's so good. <clears throat> yeah. And our DJ from Chicago wasn't available. He's making a film. Father, real quick, can we show some pictures? 2013, Cook County Jail. You perform what? Yeah, Othello the remix. Yeah, we Cook did County. Othello at Cook County Jail. Yeah, it was, it was intense. Did we get the pictures of that? I thought it was a Christmas thing. No, no, the no, one no. we did at the jail was was, was Adela's this remix. Yeah. You did this one. Yeah. yeah what was which, that like? Sheesh. I mean, you talk about a story of jealousy, murder, betrayal, and which choices. is Othello. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, then you bring it into that context, and some of the words that you're saying that you've said 400 times, you've done this show, and then completely mean something else in that environment. That it was context. it was intense. It was hair raising experience. What kind of reaction did you get? They freaked out. I mean, there was 250 men and 250 women who generally are never in the, in same, the same room, room together, yeah. and they're in the same room on two separate sides. And most of the most of the dudes were watching the ladies how they reacted, and there were some dudes who were like, 
reacting less inhibitedly, but like most of them were, I mean, until the end, they jumped up and they screamed. We have testimonials from them, but they were, it makes sense that we talked to some of them and they said, around here, you know, laughter is a sign of weakness. Like it's a vulnerable, it's a vulnerable place to be if you're enjoying yourself. So you gotta, you gotta be hard the whole time. And then uh, the ladies. I mean, that's it. We still got them. We got them. Yeah, we because got them. we're like, by the way, I mean, we should mention Othello's a tragedy. <laughs> you know, the original, but ours is a comedy. <laughs> yeah. and so uh, it's very comedic. There's a couple moments in there that hopefully give you a little emotional sucker punch. But you in, take poetic license. Oh, for sure. Big yeah, time. a ton. You don't dress up as women, do you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. Yeah, what, the, what, what play the, is great when uh, without <laughs> men dressing up as women? Man. It's Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can do what you want. Yeah. Do it at, it's New York City, man. Well, well, <laughs> but uh, no, but also like that's what Shakespeare was doing. That's right. And he was borrowing all these stories from the Greeks. And so when people get too precious with Shakespeare, I think it's important to remember he was having a blast with the stories of old from his day. You know, I suppose he taking so literally. Yeah. But I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Even when he was doing a tragedy, there was so much comedy in it. And if, it, nowadays, if you see. I mean, you know, you see plays done without adapting them. It's really, really difficult to sit through or to perform well because if you take something from 500 years ago and you want to affect people in the same way that that, that factor affected mm. people 500 years ago, I mean, how can you do it without adapting it? I mean, that's where, that's a school of thought we come so, from. I'm curious, um, given all the attention that Hamilton is getting, your reaction to it? Never heard of it. Yeah, I know. Uh, move on. <laughs> no, I so, think uh, <laughs> I do. I do. It's good. All right. So, no, no, no. You know, it, it actually sparked it's an a, impulse in us to to do Hamlet, and we're gonna call it Hamilton and put it up right there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and just hope this people. This guy's good. People were like, hey, tickets oh, only one hundred dollars. The wrong ticket on accident. Yeah. You know? Tickets today only one hundred dollars, and just collect all the runoff from there. <laughs> You're a marketing genius. Yes. <laughs> Guys um, from Chicago. No, no we, we, now we, you won a World Series. That's what happens. That's, that's, right. that's yeah. what happens. You're all cocky now. Yeah, no, um, man. We're hustlers. We're from Chicago. We we're love hip hop. You know, okay. so anyway, if your show was in hip hop, I would what watch are you it do way with this? more. Time. Come on, look how straight you need I am. To rhyme. Look, look how hard you're the whole up. show. You can do it. We'll write it for you. <laughs> how you gonna, hold, hold on one second. How are you going to freestyle and do one on one with Steve Adubato on public television and freestyle? <laughs> Are yo, you serious? Yo, yo, Come check on. it, check it. I'm I got here. Steve Badu Badu and the Brothers Q. We had one on one, we made it one on two. Yeah. Come on, no doubt, and this ain't a beater. We hanging out at Thelo the Remix Westside Theater. JQ drop the beat. We in I can't believe this. And 66th Street. Yeah, we in a room and it's all glass. I'm looking at you and you talking out your booty. What? <laughs> what? That was. That was. What? What do we do now? I mean, like after that. I mean, <laughs> first of all, I didn't think it was possible. Uh, we... I did not think it was possible. But you took one on one, a serious, <laughs> discussion oriented public. Okay, what would you do with Charlie Rose? No, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> you're not that he... serious guy. Charlie is the best. No, you're not, not that awesome. serious. Yeah. No, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. You don't mean to me. You're a good I know guy. it's all good. So um, you do workshops all over the. The world? Yeah. What do you mean, workshops or what? Yeah, so what happened is when we started touring our piece around, um, people from the community or schools nearby would bring school groups and say like, hey, can you come and like show, teach Shakespeare or teach acting through your lens? And so we started doing all these workshops and then it turned into sort of a curriculum that we have now. And, and we uh, developed over about 10 years yeah, of working and our, on it. Our, our buddy who's in the show, Jackson, who's a, um, he is our director of education, and, he, and he, he has like turned this thing into a very streamlined, cool workshop for kids. So we get high school English That's classes. Cute. We get, we've done- Adults. Uh, yeah, we did, in the prisons we did workshops. Hmm. We did workshops for third graders talking about just rhyme. You know, like, Actually, so it's, we've done it all over the we place. We went to Louisiana State uh, Penitentiary uh, with, you know, lifers and double lifers. Jay and I went down and uh, directed them in, in writing their own version of Hamlet that they put on, a hip hop version of Hamlet that they put on for their own prison community and their invited family. And you taught them? Uh, yeah, we taught Coached them, them what and, we did. An all Missouri. female Missouri. Muslim Missouri. What'd school? I say? Oh, I meant another an all-female Muslim school. You did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. in Manchester. In Manchester, in what? what? Yeah. Um, and you taught them what? We taught them how to how to, how to write rhyme. plays and rap, and yeah. just express themselves in rhyme. And re it was interesting to watch, like. Uh, 
people, when they get a forum, especially young people get a forum to express themselves and there are no rules, the kind of things that they were saying were really moving, you mm -hmm. know? It was really cool. You, yeah. you, you guys are good. You guys are really good. And I can't thank you enough thank for coming you. into the public television family and adding um, your energy, your passion, your talent, and Thanks. making one-on-one -on -one something I never thought it could or would be. Thanks, brother. Yeah. So uh, can we promote uh, Othello the Remix? Othello the Remix, check it where, out. Uh, oh. Over at the West Side Theater, 407. You know. West 43rd you know. Street, gentlemen. Ian, Thank can you. I, can I say something to the audience real, yeah, real quick? Real quick. Like, support off-Broadway theater. Broadway's got enough people going to it. Right now, we're, we, we've got to keep the lights on, and we're bringing Thank something you, that you won't ever see. You anywhere. guys are great. Thank you. Right. Anytime, come back. Thanks, brother. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Summit Medical Group, St. Peter's University, Suez, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, and by the Give Something Back Foundation. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the statewide voice of business in New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan to New York, New Jersey area. Mental health is health. There is no distinction. And emotional struggles don't just impact adults. Children suffer too. If you or a loved one is struggling with depression, emotional or behavioral health challenges, you may not want to get the help you need because you may be worried about what other people will think. But intervention can improve and even save lives. And there are resources available for the many children and families in New Jersey who struggle. Stigma should never stop you from getting the help that you need.